Jennifer Ree is an assistant professor of English at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, her PhD is from Duke University, and she's held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Bill and Carol Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry at Emory University. She works on contemporary American literature with special emphasis on uh, issues and concepts borrowed and taken over from media studies. Um, her topics include the, f the fiction of Philip K. Dick, um, and I noted uh, in, in looking, looking around at, at, her, at her CV and such that her essay on Dick's uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is concerned exactly with Masahiro Mori's Uncanny Valley, which we heard about yesterday from Lydia Liu. Jennifer's book, The Robotic Imaginary, The Human and the Price of Dehumanized Labor, will be released by uh, the University of Minnesota Press this fall. And her talk today will take up topics kindred uh, to those of the book, especially as they concern drone warfare and some artistic reflections of and on it. Uh, Chad Wellman is Associate Professor of German here at uh, UVA uh, with a PhD from UC Berkeley. He's a scholar of German romanticism and philosophy um, with a special interest in the formation of the modern university. Uh, his books include Becoming Human, Romantic Anthropology and the Embodiment of Freedom, and Organizing Enlightenment Information Overload and the Invention of the Modern University. He has also compiled with Louis Menand and Paul Reiter uh, a fascinating source book on the rise of the research university. Chad will speak to us today about the relations of machine learning to models of human epistemology. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer Ree, our first speaker. Thank you to um, Dejani uh, Ganguly for inviting me to speak today, um, and to the organizers of this exciting event, um, and to Craig Ely and Anne Gilliam for sorting out all the logistics. Um, and thanks to all of you for being here this morning after what I hope is a thoroughly wine-soaked dinner last night at the vineyard. Um, uh, today I'll be talking about drone warfare and drone art, but first I want to say a few words about artificial intelligence more broadly. In their early days, the fields of AI and robotics mostly developed technology for militarized purposes and were funded primarily by DARPA, the Defense Department Funding Agency. Today, much of AI research is funded just as much by corporations and venture capitalists as well as the Department of Defense. As AI and robotics technologies become increasingly corporatized, they're no less militarized as evidenced by collaborations, uh, numerous collaborations between, for example, Google and Facebook and the security state. Though I do want to mention Google employees' uh, recent collective action, which led to Google uh, refusing to renew their contract with the Pentagon drone program. So, uh, uh, militarized or otherwise, um, AI technologies are largely shaped by dehumanizing assumptions about whose labor, whose leisure time, and whose life is valuable, from self-driving cars to predictive policing, which is law enforcement software that claims to be able to predict and curtail crimes before they happen. And Jackie Wang has an excellent discussion of predictive policing in her book, uh, Carceral Capitalism. In my research, I examine how, despite their militarized origins, robots and AIs have often been imagined as carers, for example, uh, the AI therapist Eliza, um, and as domestic servants, uh, such as the vacuum cleaning Roomba. Drone warfare and the AI systems it employs highlight just which humans are imagined to be the beneficiaries of these robots and their reproductive labor, and just which humans are considered to be disposable, both in their replacement by robot workers and in their deaths by drone. I'll first demonstrate that racialized dehumanization is embedded in both the present of drone policies and technology and in the earlier history of cybernetics that informs them. Then I'll turn to a discussion of drone art, which I define as artworks that explicitly respond to contemporary warfare. I'll look specifically at drone artworks that challenge the continued dominance of the figure of the Western post-enlightenment subject, as discussed by De Denise De Silva, who asks, quote, why is it not self-evident that, despite the pervasiveness of cultural difference, the racial and the nation still govern the global precisely because of the way each refers to the ontological descriptors <coughs> resolved in the figure of the subject, unquote. Armed military drones are technologies of racial sorting, or as Jamie Allenson aptly describes, technologies of racial distinction. 
Early cybernetics is one of the historical <coughs> underpinnings that produced drone technology as such. Peter Gallison characterizes cybernetics as a war science and argues that this wartime context significantly shaped the development of cybernetics and its continued influence in contemporary war and culture. He traces this legacy to the early stages of Norbert Wiener's wartime work, which involved tracking and predicting the flight patterns of enemy German pilots. Gallison details that for Wiener's predictive work, Allied operators participated in simulation exercises that required them to inhabit the position of the enemy other. In other words, Allied soldiers were asked to identify with and become the German enemy other. Gallison characterizes what he calls the cybernetic other as the enemy other embodied in the blurring of German pilot and his aircraft. The cybernetic other was incorporated into the Allied operator during these simulation exercises and into one of cybernetic's great legacies, uh, namely the collapse of boundaries between human and machine as reflected in the field of AI itself and in figures such as the Terminator, the bionic woman, and the cyborg, which uh, James Evans mentioned yester yesterday in his talk. Gallison distinguishes the cybernetic enemy other in Wiener's work from a different wartime enemy other circulating in discourse at the time. This latter enemy other, embodied in the, in the Japanese soldier, was described by Allied generals as lice, ants, and vermin. The Japanese enemy other was viewed as barely human or not human at all. The dehumanized Japanese soldiers embodied a racialized enemy other that was not incorporated into Allied operator cyber cybernetic subjectivities, nor into the influential figure of the cybernetic subject. So Wiener's wartime work, as part of the founding history of cybernetics, is constitutively entangled with the exclusion and dehumanization of racialized subjects, an entanglement that finds full force in today's US military drones. Drone warfare shares many characteristics with predictive policing, particularly racial bias and vexed <coughs> promises of proleptic knowledge that collapse of past and future that Wendy uh, talked about in her talk yesterday. In concert with the racialized discourses of the global war and terror, drones operate from a power relation so asymmetric that Gregory Shamayu describes them as, quote, absolutely unilateral, end quote. In this unilateral relation, drones dehumanize those they surveil and target, in part through the scale of drone vision and the reduction of heterogeneous individuals into a singular racialized enemy other. This dehumanizing erasure of difference is embedded in the drone's technological apparatus itself as local characteristics become illegible through the decidedly Western and Eurocentric socio-technological codes <coughs> used by drone operators to identify enemy combatants. For example, codes uh, characterizing clothing and other social customs. For example, in 2010, a drone strike in Afghanistan killed 15 to 23 civilians celebrating a wedding. The transcripts of the decision-making process leading up to the strike highlight just how much is erased, just how, much are just how many are dehumanized in the reduction of humans to calculable and classificatory units, including military-aged male, which is a technical category that indicates those whom the U.S. considers killable by drones even if their identities are not known and even if their behavior is not coded as suspicious. Military age is defined as adolescent and older, so anyone who's no longer a child. As Allenson details in his analysis of the transcripts, which you can find, um, they were published by the LA, LA Times, so they're accessible online. Um, drone operators classified Afghani children as adolescents, aging them up, and erased women in order to render the entire wedding party as military-aged males and thus killable by drone. This dehumanizing ratio continues after death as the US doesn't posthumously verify whether um, killed military-aged males are in fact enemy combatants or civilians. Not coincidentally, the US excludes all dead military-aged males killed in drone strikes from the civilian death toll. This is why the US's civilian, official civilian death toll is so significantly different from other agencies' counts. For example, according to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, in 2012 alone, between 212 and 410 Pakistani civilians were killed in drone strikes. So, um, to between 212 and 410. According to the US, using its own method of counting, there were less than 10 civilian drone deaths in Pakistan in 2012. The U.S.'s consideration of all military-aged males as enemy combatants illustrates how certain human lives are counted and others discounted, and how some lives are expelled from the ex protected category of the human in their apparent killability and death by drone. Assam Atiyah's street art, 
challenges such conceptions of the human that simultaneously presume the humanity of the Western post-enlightenment subject and explicitly exclude those who fall outside this narrow yet powerful conception of the human. In 2012, Atia, a former military geospatial analyst in Iraq, installed over 100 posters and bus stops around Manhattan. He was arrested um, on 56 charges, um, but the charges were subsequently dropped. These posters depict the silhouette of a drone, presumably the property of the New York uh, Police Department, firing a missile at a fleeing family. Street signs, which also bear the name of the NYPD, similarly imagine drone strikes in use by the police department. I don't know if you can read that, um, but um, the sign shown here, um, which mimics official street sign topography, reads, <coughs> attention, authorized drone strike zone, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., including Sunday. <laughs> While another sign, placed underneath existing Department of Transportation signs denoting parking restrictions, reads, attention, local statutes enforced by drone. And some of these signs were placed strategically outside of the Guggenheim um, and outside of the UN. Atiyah's work highlights the growing technological intimacy between the military and the US police departments, which are increasingly deploying military technology, including weaponized drones. His works also evoke the police department's fraught relationship with racial minorities, from the NYPD's surveillance of Muslim communities, the stop and frisk program, which disproportionately stops black and Latino men, to the killing of black people, recently Saheed Vassell, by NYPD officers. By connecting the racial dehumanization of drone victims to formal and informal domestic policies that target people of color, these artworks highlight the dehumanization undergirding drone strikes as a form of racial violence. In this way, Atiyah's work situates U.S. drone warfare within what Nishant Upadhyay, drawing on Sylvia Winter, calls the colonial continuum, which emphasizes colonialism's continued influence and reframes racial violence as the constitutive norm of the West and of the figure of the subject that is the West's ontological and epistemological center. Hashtag not a bug splat, an installation by a group of Pakistani artists, fights drone dehumanization at the level of scale by placing large posters of Pakistani children outside where the posters can be seen from drones flying overhead. So this is the aerial, aerial perspective. The children's faces are appeals to the drone operators to see the humans who inhabit the areas they surveil and target. And the work explicitly engages children, a protected category in US military drone policy. This work directly engages the dehumanizing scale of drone vision through a confrontation with the face of a child. This aerial <coughs> confrontation works against the scale of drone vision and its metaphors, which depict humans as ants or germs. Indeed, drone vision with its aerial perspective and its narrow classificatory codes works to evade the scale at which recognition of humans as humans can take place. As the title of the project, Not a Bug Splat, connotes, the artists, in collaboration with local citizens, combat the scale of drone vision in which humans appear as small dots, more like little bugs than humans. The project also combats common dehumanizing military jargon that reduces dead drone victims to, quote, bug splats. Um, end quote, and the killing of children to, quote, cutting the grass before it gets too long, end quote. Omer Fast's short film, 5,000 Feet is the Best, uses disorientation to highlight racialized dehumanization as the boundary between identification and disidentification in the drone relation, thus hearkening back to the early cybernetic um, engagement with uh, identification. Orientations matter, Sarah Ahmed explains, because they establish paths and directions that shape worlds and the horizon of what is possible. If orientations matter, Ahmed continues, then disorientations shatter and can reorient us toward new possibilities, if no, not new worlds. Fast's film disorients at every turn, vacillating between inviting and foreclosing cinematic identification, all the while highlighting the problematic centrality of the figure of the white Western subject within the drone relation. <coughs> the film produces an uneasy and uncertain aesthetic experience by intercutting fictional vignettes with documentary elements. The fictional segments center around an interview with a drone operator in a dark Las Vegas hotel room. Uh, the first few minutes of the interview repeat three times, taking a new narrative direction with each repetition. 
In these repetitions, the operator tells the interviewer three different stories, each a story of response to the question, what's the difference between you and someone who sits in an airplane? In the first story, a man breaks into a train station to drive a train. In the second story, a Las Vegas couple, a man and a woman, use seduction to trick men out of their pants and steal their credit card numbers. And in the third story, an American family becomes, on a weekend drive, becomes collateral damage in a drone strike. These disjointed fictional segments, narrated with voiceover by the fictional drone operator, are intercut with documentary footage of Fast's interview with Brandon, a former drone operator struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. The film persistently refuses the viewer's immersion into the world of the film, despite drawing on numerous familiar cinematic techniques, tropes, and genres. In fact, one, one critic called this uh, film a film about film, right? um, uh, because of its kind of heavy engagement with these, uh, these tropes and genres. Um, for example, the repeated opening encounter between drone operator and interviewer contains a sudden piercing noise that represents the drone operator's experience of a sharp stomach pain. This noise is loud and grating, simultaneously drawing the viewer into the private pain of the operator and jolting the viewer outside of the film to tend to her own physical discomfort. It's this uncertain and disorienting terrain, the simultaneous invitation into and propulsion out of the world of the film, on which the film speaks to race and identification in the drone relation. In the fictional drone operator's first story, a young black man steals a train conductor's uniform and key card breaks into a train station and takes a train through its daily route. He does so impeccably and receives a standing ovation by all the passengers, um, and he's so delighted. As a boy, he was obsessed with model trains. Um, so um, he returns home and forget, realizes he forgot his house key. So he breaks into his own house, um, and he's arrested. Oh, wrong way, sorry. Um, the drone operator, um, at this point, the interviewer's voice breaks into the vignette and asks, okay, so why does the guy have to be black? The drone operator responds with, did I say he was black? Who said anything about color? At this moment, the film switches out the black actor with a white actor, thus recasting the vignette at its near culmination. This moment of racial disorientation hints at the third vignette, which brings drone strikes into direct conversation with racialized assumptions and the role of race in the identificatory relation. In the opening of the third vignette, a straight, white, and suburban American couple and their two children pile into their station wagon for a weekend trip. This archetypal scene of American suburban life soon becomes unfamiliar as the drone operator's voiceover narrates the journey from the driveway of their suburban neighborhood to checkpoints manned by occupied Chinese military. The drone operator narrates, quote, so the family drives down the quiet block on a weekend morning on their way to the country. They take a left, then a right, stop at the usual checkpoints, present their documents to the occupying forces. It's the same familiar route Dad takes every day of the week when he drives to work." Unquote. On their drive, the family encounters several white men armed with semi-automatic weapons. The men are digging in the middle of the road, presumably to plant an improvised bomb. The film plays with the racial coding of language, describing the men's baseball caps as, quote, traditional headdress, unquote. Um, and their t-shirts, jeans, jackets, and vests as, quote, clothes more typical to tribes from further south, unquote. <laughs> These men, armed and menacing, <laughs> appear to be up to no good. However, they let the family pass by. But unbeknownst to the men in the family, the men are being watched by a Chinese military drone. And the film gives us glimpses of the men from the drone's perspective in the moments leading up to the firing of the Hellfire missile. The missile kills the men, family also dies in the drone strike and becomes collateral damage, um, the blast radius of a Hellfire missile is approximately 50 to 65 feet. In the casting of this vignette, Fast's film, on the one hand, invites the viewer to mourn the sympathetically depicted family as the victims of a drone strike. However, this invitation is destabilized by disorienting elements, the occupying Chinese forces and the white men described using racialized language. In this world of disorienting reversals, the film suggests that if sympathy and identification are contingent on the race of the other and the other's proximity to the figure of the Eurocentric Western subject, so too are disidentification and dehumanization. Do drone strikes seem more morally reprehensible when the asymmetrical drone relation is reversed, when it's an Asian state targeting and killing white Americans? 
within the US, protests to drone strikes are frequently articulated in some kind of version of um, this is horrific. What if what were happening over there were happening over here? Fast's film reveals that this simple reversal is woefully inadequate as an ethical gesture because the hypothetical question and the language of representation themselves are, them are themselves shaped by a colonialist logic that views Western lives, though only certain Western lives, as unacceptable victims of drone violence. The film highlights that this colonial colonialist logic is a constant that it persists in shaping worlds. Indeed, the question itself emerges from a colonial colonialist logic that attempts identification, but reveals the racial exclusion that undergirds this process of identification. In other words, such appeals to identification are insufficient as they emerge from the same racialized logics that shape drone violence itself. Through disorientation, the film suggests that what might be necessary instead is a relation that embraces not just difference and the failure to overcome difference, but the fundamental unfamiliarity and unknowability in others and oneself, akin perhaps to uh, something like Edouard Glissant's um, assertion of the right to opacity, the fundamental right to not be seen or known or transparent from the perspective of Western thought and subjectivity. Throughout the interview segments, Brandon's face is blurred and his voice is masked. Brandon's also a pseudonym. He talks about what it's like to see the world from 5,000 feet, which is the optimal height for drone surveillance. He also talks about playing video games to blow off steam after work, what the world looks like through the drone's infrared technology, the first time he killed someone in a drone strike, and his struggles with post-traumatic stress disorder. In the interview segments, the film shifts from a shot of Brandon's blurred face to aerial shots of archetypal American spaces and familiar cinematic scenes. The idyllic suburban neighborhood, the Las Vegas Strip, the quaint village. For example, in the first interview segment, as Brandon describes the process of aiming a missile at a target, the film cuts to an aerial shot following a young boy biking on a dirt road. We see the boy on the bike mostly as a shadow. In age, this boy is on the cusp of the child-adolescent boundary that defines the category of military-aged male. Would a drone operator identify this young boy as a child, thus letting him live, or an adolescent, and thus killable? As Brandon speaks, at first it's unclear how his words work with the aerial shots they overlay. As the camera follows the young boy on his bike, Brandon describes watching targets using different drone cameras. As Brandon continues, the camera slowly zooms out, the boy becoming no more than a speck, as the dirt road is revealed to be the entrance to a vast suburban enclave outside of Las Vegas. In the opening of these aerial shots, the camera's movement through these iconic American spaces is smooth and soothing. But as Brandon's descriptions progress, the camera's movements begin to work in concert with his descriptions of targeting and killing and of his PTSD. And the camera perspective begins to evoke the drone perspective. Like the recasting of actors in the operator's first vignette, these interview segments first present the viewer with familiar shots of familiar cinematic spaces, then pull a kind of bait and switch not unlike the Las Vegas con couple in the operator's second vignette. Then, too late, the viewer realizes that these soothing, cinematic, familiar aerial shots have seamlessly become aligned with Brandon's view from a drone. In other words, the film coaxes the viewer to participate in these shots, moving through the suburb, the quiet village, and the Las Vegas Strip along with the camera, only to align these scenes, and thus the viewer's participation within them, with Brandon's work surveilling and killing. The final interview segment concludes on a simultaneously peaceful and fraught evening shot of Las Vegas. Meanwhile, Brandon talks about killing his first target and, quote, when the dream started, end quote. Immediately after, the film cuts to the same shot in which it opens, a shot of the fictional drone operator in the hotel hallway. Fast's film is part of a larger installation piece exhibited at the Venice Biennale in 2011. In the original installation piece, um, which is now housed in LACMA, uh, the film is played on a continuous loop, the scenes repeating endlessly. In this recursive structure, both film and installation suggest that disorientation foundationally characterizes war practices despite algorithmic assignations um, that claim otherwise. Further, the film has continually subverted the viewer's desire to identify with the character as well as the camera. By refusing such identification, the film suggests that the ethical, in the context of drone strikes, 
lies outside of such identification and is dead in disorientation and uncertainty. The artworks I discuss today speak to racialized identification's foundational role in early cybernetics and in contemporary drone warfare, specifically by highlighting identification's entanglement with dehumanization and its imbrication in the colonial continuum. These works of drone art locate dehumanization not in drone victims, but in the US and the West with their histories and continued practices of state-sanctioned racial violence, both overseas and domestically. In the face of this dehumanization, these artworks refuse an ethics founded on identificatory practices that privilege the figure of the Western post-enlightenment subject. Instead, these artworks turn to relations that challenge drone dehumanization and the, and the abiding conceptions of the Western subject this dehumanization scaffolds. In so doing, these works gesture to a conception of the human that does not re replicate the colonial continuum, but refuses, instead, dehumanizing racial exclusions. This conception of the human, constituted through disorientation and encounters with the algorithmically unknown, works against cybernetic principles of predictability, against the post-enlightenment human and its colonial legacies, and against the racialized logics that structure many AI visions of the human. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, so my name is uh, Chad Wellman. Um, Deb Johnny, where's Deb Johnny? Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I heard you guys had a great uh, dinner, or I imagine that you had a great dinner. I was in an airport flying back last night, um, but Pippin Hill's beautiful. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so today I want to talk about both a historical problem, but also situate it in terms of a particular project um, that I'm working with with some, some colleagues whom I'll talk about. Jennifer, thank you so much uh, for your great talk. So in the unreasonable effectiveness of data from 2009, three Google researchers encouraged scholars to, quote, forego elegant theories, elaborate models, and complex rules, and just follow the data. Given the increasing availability of highly structured data on the web, Scholars interested in designing translation algorithms, for example, should just move away from earlier concerns with hand-coded grammars, ontologies, and logic-based expert systems, and take advantage of the structure already in the data. The sheer quantity of data, they contended, could replace endless efforts to find linguistic rules and encode them into the machines. Now, almost a decade later, 2018, the predictions that big data would deliver a knowledge without theory Causal explanations, or even models, seems a bit naive, an atheoretical empiricism for our digital age. And yet, as Jennifer just described wonderfully, the machine learning methods and techniques touted by the Google researchers are now part of the infrastructures that shape our daily lives, helping Netflix recommend shows, banks decide whom to lend to, and courts set parole and prison sentences. Along with this ubiquity, has come increased scrutiny. And much of this attention has focused not on older questions about AI, what can machines do or still not do, but rather on cultural and social questions concerning justice, equity, and power. Questions guided by the premise that epistemology and ethics cannot be easily separated. Regardless of whether machines can think, the computational processes of machine learning obscure all too human biases, prejudices, and inequities. And perhaps most perniciously, Machine learning produces an opaque knowledge that conceals more than it reveals. Faced with the prospect of an inscrutable knowledge that cannot, account for, cannot be accounted for, scholars such as Kate Crawford have enjoined machine learning researchers to move, beyond, to move toward greater transparency and accountability in how they develop their training data sets, design their algorithms, and put them to use in the world. And here I just have two of the more egregious uh, examples I taught this semester as case studies. You may have heard of these. One uh, was a study um, from Chinese res researchers that claimed to have taught machines to recognize um, possible violent offenders based on facial rec recognition technology. And another, um, one of the two PIs was a Stanford researcher that claimed to have detected sexual orientation uh, based on facial recognition technology. But, so in this push to call for more intelligibility, transparency, I want to ask a different sort of question. What do we mean by transparency and accountability? 
and should they be our primary epistemic ideals? Machine learning's purported opacity, not just ignorance about its techniques, challenges long-standing ep epistemic ideals, especially the notion of knowledge as justified true belief. The idea that legitimate knowledge can be accounted for and explained by a human knower. This is an epi epistemic ideal, however, with moral weight. Real knowledge, and I think this is a long-standing presupposition, real knowledge ought to be intelligible. The increased capacities in public scrutiny of machine learning techniques, then, provide not just a legitimate reason for scholarly and social concern, right? I mean, those two studies are patently, not patently absurd. I mean, you have to study them to see why they're absurd. Um, but also an opportunity to reconsider the ideals and commitments underlying long-standing conceptions of knowledge in Western philosophical and cultural traditions. The ideals, the norms, the practices, and the virtues that have helped determine what counts as knowledge, who legitimates it, and who renders it accessible and searchable. Now, this is part of a larger project on the history of search um, that I'm, it's an ongoing project on the media, technologies, practices, and institutions that have organized knowledge and those who know from early modern encyclopedias and universities to Google PageRank and neural networks. And today, however, I just want to touch on two very general points. One, so how might this history of search help us attend to multiple and maybe even conflicting epistemic ideals? Ideals that knowledge is not, is not only certain, should on, not only be certain, visible, and a personal possession, but also communicable, iterable, and perhaps even a common good. And second, how might the inscrutability of knowledge, or excuse me, I also want to touch on the fact that the inscrutability of knowledge has a history that long predates recent machine learning techniques. In a history, I think particular to this group here, a history that includes humanistic knowledge practices. In the Mino, Socrates asks why knowledge is more valuable than, quote, right opinion. Why does it matter, for example, to someone asking me how to get to Alderman Library here at, at UVA, if I, having never been to the library and having no knowledge of how to get there, give them directions based on a guess that just happens to be right. I don't know, go south on Emmett, take a left on University, then a right on McCormick. I don't know for sure, but I think that's right. As opposed to, why, how does this differ from giving them those same directions on something more sure, such as my experience, having been on the faculty here and going to Alderman every day, based on having walked that same path innumerable times? Knowledge, Socrates says to me now, is prized far more highly than right opinion. Even if opinions happen to be true, they are not stable. They are like the statues of Daedalus, the ancient Greek craftsmen who fashioned sculptures that, as legend had it, could move. Like the statues, right opinions, says Socrates, aren't worth much. Until one ties them down by giving an account of the reason why. Knowledge is right opinion that is fastened, grounded in a stable and clear relationship between a person who knows and some given reality or truth. Knowledge so conceived entails personal comprehension, intelligibility, and a certain form of possession. Now, on Socrates' account, it's, of course, the immortal soul's recollection of timeless forms that ties knowledge down by binding the soul with a reality more stable and lasting than any finite body. And although Western philosophical traditions have long adapted, adopted, and rejected such a platonic account, the basic notion, right, this is my contention, the basic notion that knowledge is primarily a personal and superior mental state has persisted. From Aristotle to Aquinas, from Locke to Kant, philosophers in the Western philosophical tradition have tied real knowledge to a capacity to give explicit reasons and to understand why. To know, as Descartes put it in 1644, is to hold something, an idea, a perception, very clearly and distinctly. Now, given this tradition, given the persistence of these epistemic ideals, what are we to make, then, of deep neural or convolutional networks? Right? Algorithms with hidden layers who out, whose outputs and the various steps that produce them are often incomprehensible. Even though humans have coded their individual steps, these algorithms combine ever more steps and inputs to produce outputs and behaviors that even their human designers cannot fully account for. 
Contemporary machine learning techniques raise the prospect of a kind of knowledge, the output of neural networks, that cannot be accounted for in the way that Socrates argues was, was necessary to distinguish knowledge from right opinion, knowledge from mere information, perhaps an alien knowledge. And yet, scholars and intellectuals have long relied on tools and technologies not fully in their possession, and oftentimes not wholly transparent to them, in order to justify their opinions, in order, that is, to know. I'm going to shift very briefly um, to a late 18th, uh, 19th century German context and the rise of the research university. So that's the background. Surveying the semantic shifts that knowledge, Wissenschaft, had undergone over the course of the 18th century, an entry in Adelung's Lexicon, a multi-volume German dictionary first published around 1800, described a fundamental change in the conception of knowledge. At the beginning of the century, it read, knowledge had been used to describe, quote, a subjective condition in which a person knows. It was a capacity of clear and distinct ideals, uh, ideas. By 1800, however, read the article, knowledge had come to refer not only to a subjective mental state, but also to an objective reality, general truths that were grounded in each other. Knowledge as an internal relationship among ideas themselves, and more broadly, and this is crucial, an increasingly distinct realm in which these ideas had taken material form in objects and systems, in media and practices, and most importantly, for the 19th century, institutions. Over the course of the 19th century, the second notion of knowledge, knowledge is somehow extra-personal, came to predominate, at least in German-speaking lands. No knowledge was deeply, but not only, human. Now, these conceptual shifts crystallized an array of 18th century efforts to reckon with a widespread sense of material excess, the proliferation of print, as well as observational and eventually experimental data. As knowledge came to constitute its own objective reality, scholars and scientists struggled to interact with and make sense of an objective knowledge that was thought to exist outside of their heads. While some celebrated the growth of this extrapersonal knowledge as a path to intellectual and social social progress, others, like Immanuel Kant, worried that it would soon outstrip human capacity to control it. But whether they embraced it or whether they feared it, all scholars and intellectuals engaged or sought out techniques and technologies for navigating, organizing, and searching it. If knowledge existed in an objective reality not reducible to individual minds, then its authority, then its legitimacy, cannot be wholly grounded in individual rational capacities, and its transmission, just as importantly, exceeded person-to-person -person exchanges. And so, and I have a giant dash in my talk, uh, you know, and the dash stands in for a whole range of things that I, I'm not gonna talk about in any detail. Uh, more gran granular histories, like the rise of the scientific or scholarly periodical over the course of the 19th century, the institutionalization of disciplinary scholarly knowledge, the rise of the seminar, uh, the organization of the modern laboratory, uh, the professional scholarly societies, um, and then, of course, the organization of all of these technologies and media by the modern research university. And so, as subjective knowledge became objective knowledge, the persona of the modern knower, the modern scholar, came to entail a capacity to devise and make good use of media through practices and techniques of search. Scholars' practical need to orient themselves in the ever-expanding domains of knowledge, however, required not just search technologies and techniques, but search practices, ideals, and virtues that could form the types of people who could use these tools and better engage these objective domains of knowledge. Scholarly communities developed and cultivated this one crucial epistemic ideal in particular, that the objectivation of knowledge, it's a horrible word, I need to find a better word, uh, the, the becoming objective of knowledge, was also the process of making it common, shared, and universally communicable. Knowledge was not simply a private possession, it was a common good and collective undertaking. But even as the ideals of communicability, publicness, and sociality of knowledge were institutionalized in 19th century universities in particular, the specter of the incommunicability and the opacity of knowledge remained. Such a, because such a knowledge was only available to those with access to search technologies, only available to those educated in the practices, ideals, and virtues that sustain their right use. Whoever defined the parameters of search then, the categories, the keywords, the techniques, the disciplinary uh, ways of life, determined what could become visible as knowledge. 
And furthermore, few if any of the scholars and intellectuals who interacted and fought within this objective domain of knowledge would have been able to give a step-by-step, rule-based account of how they did so, much less an account of the domain as a whole. In short, even if searchable for some, modern scholarly knowledge was never fully transparent, intelligible, or personal. And I want to return to my opening questions about machine learning. And how, what in the world does this have to do um, with our current predicament? So considering, I would say, considering the long history of epistemic opacity and inscrutability, which I've only gestured to, I think this can help us better evaluate our current epistemic ecosystem in which machine-human interactions have become ever more central. If you'll recall, the Google researchers, you know, and I love, they use the word researchers, though two of the three authors um, had just been recently poached. Um, I say poached uh, from Carnegie Mellon, because I think that's one of the things when I talk about ep epistemic ecosystem, the, the power centers in that ecosystem are shifting, especially in the, in the interact human-machine interactions. I mean, computer science programs are having a very difficult time competing with Google, uh, which is buying them off. And I think in, we have to deal with the fact that the, that the virtues and practices are very distinct um, in those two institutions. So that's kind of underlying all of this. So if you recall, the Google researchers with whom I began held out a distinct epistemic ideal, what they called the unreasonable effectiveness of data that would obviate the need for hypotheses or theories that is for scholarly knowledge as it has been practiced in universities for about two centuries now. There are limits, obviously, both epistemically and ethically, to this ideal of an atheoretical empiricism. And these limits are bound up with the institutional and social location of machine learning techniques and researchers. In conclusion, I want to consider these limits as I've encountered them in a project I'm leading with Andrew Piper at McGill and Mohamed Charré at the University of Quebec called The Visibility of Knowledge, a computational study of scientific illustration in the long 19th century. Now, I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, we can talk about that later because actually we got our first, the, uh, first insights last night about footnotes. And I'm happy to talk about that after the talk if you want. <coughs> in short, we're training machines to detect a range of visual features and print materials published between 1700 and 1900, from footnotes and diagrams to tables and illustrations. Our ultimate goal is to better understand the relationship between visuality and scientific knowledge. Think of it as um, an attempt simply to extend uh, Daspin and Gallison's objectivity, if you happen to know that, but at scale. Um, but we're also experimenting with types of facts and evidence and methods that historians and literature scholars have not traditionally used. And we're encountering the limits of some of our own established ideals and norms in the process. So our first step in this is a five-year project. We're on year two. Our first step was to train machines to detect footnotes from the 18th century collections online data set using supervised learning models, layout models, and convolutional neural networks. In all, we have about 32 million page images from over 100,000 documents. Now, in our efforts to train machines to detect footnotes, we quickly bumped up against the limits of what I've called an atheoretical empiricism. The first limit. The first limit has to do with prediction as an epistemic ideal. And Jennifer touched on this in her opening, how all of these uh, practices uh, were funded post-war post um, government and uh, university um, joint projects, but also corporate projects as well. Actually, you know, one of the most interesting ones were uh, the post office trying to teach their machines to read addresses. That was one of the, that was some of the biggest steps in the facial, tech, re facial recognition technology was the post office needing to teach machines to learn how, and banks, right? so it's, it's fascinating history. Uh, so back to you. Uh, so the first limit, prediction. In many areas of machine learning, prediction is often prized more than knowledge about an interpretable or mechanistic model. This is certainly true of my beloved colleagues at the Synchro Media Lab at the University of Quebec, whose primary aim is developing algorithms and methods with the highest degree of predictive accuracy possible. The goal of research on their account is less the construction of a model that might help better understand a phenomenon or a more an or more, and, and it's more an expansion of predictive power through the accumulation of computational capacity and more data. If all the data is valued, and this is my concern, right? If all data is valued primarily for its predictive potential, then scholars will tend to regard the outputs of machine learning as dispositive and not as evidence to be further analyzed. 
it runs the risk, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, it runs the risk, that is, of removing the interpretive process. The second limit, I would say, is more interesting. The second limit of an atheoretical empiricism is that it belies the actual practice of human supervision inherent in machine learning activities. Learning is never not theory driven, whether it involves machines or people or both. One of the affordances of computational research, at least as Andrew and I have realized them, is the way that it can possibly right, make assumptions far more explicit than traditional research in the humanities. There is a necessary visibility to computational research processes that challenges norms of erudition or scholarly judgment that underlie non-computational fields. Andrew and I, for example, were forced to be extremely explicit about our expert assumptions and reasoning. As we led a team of faculty and students through the creation of our data set, just give you some, a brief sense of what that was, tw over 22,000 page images, 6,000 6, annotated as footnotes, 16,000 as not footnotes, which we then used to teach in the scene what we consider to be a footnote, and then another around 6,000 pages that we used to test it. So as we did this annotation, right, we, as we did this, we argued, we debated, and we finally decided what counted as a footnote. So even, th this is simply to say, um, right. so this is simply to say that imagine expanding this process to the types of algorithmic annotation that Jennifer was talking about, human beings. We did this with footnotes, and it took us 10 months, ultimately, to develop a feature definition of what a footnote is. We are pedants. We're not deciding whether people live or die, and it was extremely difficult, right? Um, just to give you a sense. So our understanding of the category footnote became more nuanced, but also more explicitly and iteratively, iteratively, iterative. if I can't say it, I probably shouldn't write it. I should, sorry. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking in office hours. Um, so it became more explicitly and iteratively defined over more and more pages. But it's just this circularity, the iterative process of human-machine interaction that has become the object of so much criticism. Since machine learning encodes our own judgments and biases into the learning process, argue some critics, scholarlies will simply reproduce, quote, what we already know or confirm their prior assumptions. Just read the monthly chronicle attack on any computational humanities projects. As a standard and often unreflexive response, this reaction belies what I would argue a rather naive understanding or disingenuous account of scholarly knowledge more generally. And it brings me back to my original concern with intelligibility and transparency as primary epistemic ideals. According to the logic of knowledge as research, as developed in modern research universities um, from 19th century Berlin and Baltimore to 20th century Berkeley and Chicago, new knowledge is generated from the grounds of expert knowledge. This is one of the fundamental premises of academic institutions, to which the epistemology and ethics of search technologies I discussed earlier was central. Scholars of all disciplines encode expertise into their explorations of some particular archive, via the library, the internet, or the human brain. Similarly, scholars using machine learning techniques encode their learning, or in a more traditional sense, learnedness or erudition into the analytical process from the outset. In the case of machine learning, inscrutability, I would argue, is not necessarily, although it often is, a feature of algorithmic processes. Training data can, in most cases, be released for public viewing and analysis. Our aim in the Visibility of Knowledge Project is to develop scholarly methods that render our judgments visible, just as we also make the history of visualizing knowledge itself more visible. And yet, limits to such visibility do remain. Many of the most common machine learning techniques and algorithms, such as the neural networks that we use in our analysis, are justifiably called inscrutable, too mathematically complex to be fully transparent to human understanding. Consider, for example, this. These are samples of the features used in various convolutional layers of our neural network. Each layer represents an increasingly abstracted and thus more general representation of our page data as the model gradually attempts to approximate the two ideals, footnote, non-footnote. That's what you're looking at up there, right? Um, a page without a footnote and a page with a footnote. And yet, there is nothing visible in this data that helps us reconstruct the conditions of such judgment. Where's the judgment? It's very alien. The means through which the classification is arrived at. 
black box is not even a metaphor here. It's, that's what, it's what you see. And it's in just this sense that machine learning seems to confound many long-held notions of knowledge as a, a form of justified true belief. The idea that authoritative knowledge can be explained, not that only that it can be, that it must be explained and accountable, accounted for. And yet I would argue that certain forms of unaccountability and opacity are endemic to most all forms of expertise, especially in the humanities. The judgment of a scholar about the meaning of a poem, or the judgments historians make when relating facts to one another, or to an argumentative whole. Scholarship is based not only on method, more or less transparent and repeatable processes, but also on tacit knowledge, forms of insight and practices that are never made fully explicit. We are well served, I would suggest, by starting from the premise that we can always know more than what we say, especially when it comes to what we do. So what kind of knowledge is machine learning? It's human, it's machine, it's both. Acknowledging this enmeshment is crucial if we were to better understand the epistemic norms, ideals, and virtues that guide how we create, share, and also hoard our knowledge, but also to imagine different ways of knowing. It entails an attention to the layered mediations of knowledge, the way knowledge passes through technical systems in both its production and its reception, whether these be bibliographic, methodological, algorithmic, or institutional, whether studying footnotes or neural nets or the modern research university. Making knowledge visible is always the hard one fruit of humans thinking with their machines. Thank you. Sure, sure. I'm uh, Brian McGrath from Clemson University. Um, th thank you. I enjoyed both. <laughs> you can find me. I'm in the middle. Um, uh, I enjoyed both papers very much. Um, and I'm sorry I don't yet have a question that brings them both together, though I found the resonances very um, illuminating. This question is for uh, Jennifer. Um, I was I interested in the, the ways in which you privileged dehumanization over, say, reification or objectification, and the ways in which dehumanization assumes that something is being uh, taken away or undone as, of, as opposed, say, to objectification or reification, the kind of making the animate inanimate in order mm -hmm. to make it disposable. And I wonder, I would just be curious to hear more about why dehumanization is the term that you want to care that you carried through uh, and what that term does that objectification or reification doesn't do yeah um, so dehumanization for a number of reasons uh, first uh, in, in my larger research project I draw a kind of um, uh, brief history of robotics and AI it, it is a brief history um, uh, formalized history it starts uh, in 1950 right so um, but the first appearance of the word um, robot, as, as some of you may know, was in a 1920 uh, play by Carl Chopek. Um, and um, the robot, um, in the figure of the robot in that play was originally a, a human created by artificial means, but, ex but explicitly human that was then stripped of all human qualities and except for, for the capacity to work, right? So, um, and, and human appearance. So it's that kind of, um, it's, it's that etymological um, history that, that drives uh, my use of dehumanization, but also dehumanization for me really places the onus of, of on, the, on, the on, on, the, the, on those who do the process of stri stripping away humans, right? So it, it directs the agency towards um, those who dehumanize. I really enjoy both of these papers, I learned a lot. Um, uh, but I also have a, a comment for Jennifer in particular. Um, <clears throat> the dehumanization, to come back to that question, 
reminds me of the process of dehumanization in Rwanda, mm. the genocide that took place, which had colonial roots. It had enablement from the French government, Belgium in particular, in fact, the whole wide world. Um, but I'm thinking of a particular novel um, where in the hand-to-hand -hand combat between those who were killing and those who were being killed, I'm thinking of a novel by Boris Jopp, uh, who's a Senegalese writer. And one of the things that he seems to, s he, he, he puts front and center is that when the people who were being dehumanized, who were called cockroaches in, in fact, um, stood up and refused to accept that, 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 that designation, it suddenly put the killers it, it put them off balance. Mm -hmm. They weren't prepared mm -hmm. to be confronted by people who refused to be subjugated and dehumanized. And while this, so now in this, this instance, we're looking at the incredible impact of the drone, of, the, of, the, of IT, of artificial intelligence, and, and the mechanization in those powers. Um, and I wonder how you would think about those two instances, and I, I know there are infinite number of others, mm -hmm. But what does, the, um, what does the drone, what does artificial intelligence bring to that process that, that puts it at perhaps another level, not just a question of degree, but the level seems to me to have been enormously, um, you know, a sort of uh, sprouted. It mm -hmm. has become very, very powerful. And I wonder how you would think about those sort of uh, very human, hand-to-hand -hand human instances versus this massive uh, sh machinery that enables such mass destruction of human life. Yeah, oh no, thank you. Um, yeah, I think maybe one way to characterize um, what's happening with AI in relation to drones um, is the question of scale, right? Um, scale, not just in terms of, um, especially when, when um, with, with your example of the kind of, um, the individual, right, or, or a group of individuals, right? That that's a kind of scale of of perception or visibility that's often foreclosed by a kind of drone aerial perspective, right? Or by um, uh, the kind of um, big data sets, right? Um, that that kind of um, uh, uh, the 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 level of the individual. And to be honest, I'm still grappling with this, right? And I was thinking about this um, yesterday uh, at Wendy's talk as well, but um, I think there's, for me, that's why um, artistic and literary responses to drone strikes, for example, is, um, are so powerful because they can intervene on the level of scale and in ways that, that we often can't, um, that the drone often doesn't allow or that um, uh, vast AI or automated systems often don't allow, right? Precisely because of the, the, the uh, kind of attention to um, the level and the affect of the individual. The, the man right here in the middle, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you both uh, speakers. I very much appreciate it. Uh, a question for Chad, uh, effectively, uh, I see what you're doing with your project as a translation back and forth between formal languages and natural languages, and so that you have uh, a, a view into the technology where you're looking at uh, new kinds of properties that have been introduced into the world. Uh, so in your story about the various levels of the neural networks, you're seeing abstractions emerge that cannot be translated directly into a, a natural language uh, quality or uh, description. But I'm wondering if you're getting categories of uh, computational artifacts that let you get some handle on what that experience means. So like in the, the classic image that appear appeared a year or so ago about a cat, you know, a machine learning the discovery of a cat on the web with thousands of pictures, it was not finding cat features the way we would form categories. 
but are you getting to the point where you can say identify what it was that the uh, machines are noticing and, and coming up with categories for what that kind of thing is? <coughs> uh, we just recently, um, so we did footnotes, right? Very exciting. Um, uh, we're, we're uh, we just finished kind of our first um, training data set on tables, and it was a perfect example of just what you're talking about. Um, and I, I love talking about it. It's so, uh, it's so distancing talking about these pedantic artifacts, but it really brings home exactly to my mind like the, the human machine judgments mm -hmm. implicit in everything that Jennifer said. Um, so that's the background and why I'm actually kind of doing all this stuff. I mean, I have my own scholarly interest while I'm interested in footnotes. But so tables. Um, so we had to define, you know, we had to set up uh, basically um, an algorithm by, by which I simply mean a set of steps for our, our, our research team um, to create the 20,000, you know, uh, page data set. And, and it happened repeatedly after our testing data set that the machine kept returning um, TOCs, table of contents, as tables. And it took us, and so, you know, our, you know, Muhammad, and he's got like 30, like, incredibly brilliant um, graduate students in computer science, and they were absolutely confounded, you know. And so we had our first uh, post-run uh, table meeting, and Andrew, it, of course, took us less than 10 seconds. Look at the white space, right? And because, you know, the machine, you know, how we had ended up defining tables and it, it recognized there's a relationship between vertical and horizontal space, just picture a, a table of contents in your mind. And so for all intents and purposes, the machine thought or decided return, however you want to put it, output, uh, that a, a TOC was a table. So that's just one example of things that gurgle up constantly. Uh, when we did the footnotes, the thi the one of the best predictors, feature predictors of footnotes was the differentiation in script, you know, footnote text and body text. And Andrew, I mean, I am somewhat kind of a historian of print, but Andrew Piper, if, if you know his work, he's an actual, like he knows stuff <laughs> really well about that. And, uh, and even Andrew was kind of surprised that that would be uh, one of the best two predictors. Um, so we're learning a whole range of things, but we're really learning about the history, the history of print, um, and the history also, uh, what I would say, the normalization of print. So for example, it turns out that we couldn't create the network of footnotes that we wanted until about the beginning of the 19th century footnotes because the citation practices in the 18th century, um, again, it anecdotally it might not surprise us, but we can show how varied they were. They were just all over the place. So for example, you take a, a German text, and in the same text it might cite, for example, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason in 11 different ways. Um, the normalization of those practices, I based on the data we've seen so far, uh, seems much later than we would have ever anticipated. So those are the types of kind of insights that, um, on the one hand, yes, we think they, they have um, real significance for our more closer kind of Dastan to Gallison related project, but they also um, really make much more visible how the human machine judgments are, it's very hard to distinguish them. And when it comes to determining um, questions, racial distinctions, I mean, just imagine, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's just as, it's even more difficult, but the moral weight of that is compounded. Um, so I would say the scale, right, it's not just a scale of how much, but it's the scale of the moral weight and differentiation uh, that is occluded and made increasingly unintelligible, yeah. Okay, we have a cue. I'm gonna point to some people. So uh, first, Andres here, uh, and then the woman in the middle of the back, and then there's a woman over here who had her hand up, and a man over here. Those are the four that I have right now. Um, and we'll ch and get through them, I hope, and maybe some others. Thank you very much uh, to both of us, both of you, sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm going to start, uh, I mean, the question originally was for chat, but I think that both could uh, cope with it. And it has to do with this uh, hypothesis of the human machine learning or knowledge as a place where really it's being dissolved, this opposition between human and the machine, no longer uh, in such strict terms. And chat, uh, remember the history of the 
transformations of the conception of knowledge in German 19th century. And he also made a very strong point in making the, I mean, the separation between subjective mental and objective reality, also stressed the differentiation between so in the beginning between naive realism and sort of transcendental uh, position derived from Kantian philosophy. But uh, I was uh, waiting to make for the differentiation between the natural sciences uh, and the sciences of the spirit, which is the big, <laughs> big dif differentiation of knowledge in, in 19th century Germany. Um, I mean, between the humanities, really, what they call the sciences of the spirit and natural science, the difference between research of what in principle is given nature, uh, let's say a piece of metal, a planet, and research of what is created by human beings, let's say democracy, which is not a given, it's a model of governance that have been created by human beings, and that they define different methodologies. Epistemologically, it's not the same to be right and to prove something than to create an inhabitable world. It have nothing to do can with we, can we a world that you can inhabit. It's not the same to prove that you're right than to create a world that you can inhabit. I mean, they have different epistemologies. Andres, so can the Andres, question Andres, is Andres, Andres, excuse me. Can can we can we stop there? And th that's a very important question. Can we stop there and let him? The question is work with that. Okay, but yeah, I mean, the question is very quickly: uh, is from this difference as a point of view, where would you situate uh, if we play to maintain this difference between the social sciences and the, or not social science, humanities and natural science? Where would you place this machine human knowledge, mm -hmm. or machine human knowledge is a place where you sh we should use to precisely destroy this distinction? Um, I would concede the dif differentiation neither historically nor conceptually. Um, historically, I wouldn't concede it because I would argue um, that the, the Geisteswissenschaften Diltai, I mean, the way he understands it conceptually and in, in the, not just in the German situation, but because as it is exported, it, it's seen to be a historical emergence under the conditions of, natu of, of natural sciences. So I would argue that the methodologies actually um, that isn't not or more than epistemology isn't the crucial distinction. The crucial distinction is a moral one, right? What he calls the um, the Bergfreiheit uh, just just mentioned, right? So the kind of the what would you say the fort the the fort around the human uh, autonomy that is the project of the modern humanities, right? Trying to fence it off uh, from the moral uh, or the anthropological imagination of natural sciences, right? So. One, methodologically, I wouldn't argue. I would say that historically, they're they're not that um, they're not that distinct as we might like them might like like them to be. And this is to go to a more immediate question about kind of the plight of the humanities today. And just, I mean, this is one that's increasingly pressing on me. Um, what are the grounds of the distinction we would like to make um, between the humanities and a range of other forms of knowledge? Are they actually epistemological? Are they political? Or are they moral, right? And I'm, we can make those arguments. I just think we need to be honest uh, about the grounds of the distinctions we wish to make, right? Because I have deep doubts that they're actually that epistemologically different. Um, they might be politically different. That was the direction you went. But I would ultimately, historically speaking, about how the humanities took shape in German universities and definitely how they took shape between 1930 and 1950 in U.S. institutions, they were explicitly moral projects, right? Set out to define a certain form of humanism um, that undergirds certain claims. That that would be my kind of response, and it might not uh, agree at all. <laughs> For fantastic talks, um, my name is Allison Langmead. I'm at the University of Pittsburgh, and my question sort of sits between you both, um, and it will go back to the dehumanizing conversation. So I'll start with a, a postulate of sorts. Part of the reason that we're so fascinated with the output of machine learning is that it looks human. But we don't know why it has these outputs. We recognize it. And the more and more these outputs look like something we believe, and we just believe them, the more likely we, we are to use them, even though, as Chad pointed out so expertly, we actually don't know why they result in the way they do. And so I'd like to place that in dialogue with the dehumanization that you were talking about, Jennifer, throughout your fantastic talk, and just ask you guys to respond about the place we're actually putting the human in this interaction that, we, that we're having. We use it to dehumanize, and then we want them to behave like humans. Could you respond to that placement in any way you'd like? I'm still, I'm, I'm struck by your, um, 
Yes, we want them to behave like humans. And you know, you said uh, the outputs look human, right? And I, I would, um, I would maybe pause even there and say, well, what version of, of the human do they look like, right? Because I'm sure that that's not the version of the human um, that that everyone would necessarily kind of concede to, right? So even there, I think there's a whole realm of kind of um, opacity, right? Um, to go back to, to uh, a key concept for, for Chad and his work um, around what is human and how we are, every time we evoke that term, it's a provisional one, right? Um, in these conversations. Um, my my uh, humanistic uh, motives are to hold open that, that category, at, to, to insist on it being as capacious as possible, right? So, um, for, m for me, I think it's, it's about how AI systems kind of either kind of speak to that um, by narrowing a vision of the human with often kind of um, horrific consequences um, or offer new reconfigurations of a human. Hi, um, my question is a little bit more practical. It's Gabriela Torres from Wheaton College. Um, I was really interested in Chad's collaboration, actually, um, and wanted to know practically how it developed. Um, and further, whether the collaboration makes you teach in a different way, engaging in that collaboration. I'm, I think over the past four years especially, um, a significant proportion of my research and writing is collaborative because um, it's fun uh, and people are a lot smarter than I am and I get to join in the credit when we write together. I mean, that, you know. Um, so, f uh, for example, my, my collaboration with Andrew, for example, which were a ho whole host of things that grew out of, uh, um, we, uh, we, d we did a, a project together interacting with print. Um, it was a group of 20 of us over about four years actually wrote a book together that on the history of print it started um, as a wiki and it came out with Chicago uh, just this past um, spring so it kind of grew out of that and that really inspired me and we really it wasn't just everybody wrote a chapter but everybody s it started off with an event where everybody wrote a thousand words and then we basically signed an oath that we disowned them and over the next three years it turned into this, you know, 300-page book on the history of interacting with print. Um, so that's kind of how the history of this grew out, and um, and so Andrew and I have just different different projects uh, have 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 emerged out of that. Um, and then now Andrew's been working with Muhammad, who runs the Synchromedia Lab, um, who is um, he does natural uh, visual language processing, and he has a lab, and he just he's brilliant, and his graduate students are brilliant, and I just every Every other week when we have our lab meeting, I just I get schooled, and it's great. I love it. Um, and it's absolutely changed the way I teach. Uh, Siva, I don't know if si Siva, I know he's flying in from Berlin. Siva Vadianathan and I um, taught all year together in the new uh, gen ed curriculum that we have here at UVA. Um, and that was amazing. We taught it's kind of basically the ethics and epistemology of data. And again, I mean, Siva has a vast amount of knowledge that I just don't. Um, and so we, we complement each other. And so it's changed kind of everything, the way I comport myself to my colleagues, but also fundamentally also the way I imagine um, epistemic possibilities. Sure. Over here, is there a, there is a. Thank you both, and um, I have a question that I'm not sure is the question that you've been posing or a question that I've been hearing through my own question. Uh, my name's Ken Colton Fromm from Haverford College. I was struck, Jennifer, by your comment, the right not to be seen, which I think was qualified by Western perspectives. But I'm interested in just that comment of right not to be seen and connection with Chad, with, uh, with Kant's um, Aufklärung, you know, that in that title of enlightenment, of making something seen. And I, and I wanted to ask you about the ethics of making something visible. Not as a limit, not as opacity, as a limit, but the but thinking about opacity uh, as a good or as an ideal. And for me, 
just as a background to that, it, it, it raises for me that Catholic virtue of mystery that, that enables a certain kind of epistemic humility. So for me, it has sort of a religious um, feature to it, but I'm just interested in how you would think about the ethics of making visible. Yeah, uh, the right to opacity is, is from Ed Edouard Glissant, um, and so that's, that was his uh, formulation. Uh, and I agree, it's, it's incredibly um, uh, captivating, uh, particularly now, interestingly enough, for the kinds of um, thinking that I'm doing around uh, contemporary AI and um, uh, drone warfare. Um, I I really like your phrase, epistemic humility. Um, I think there's something about this being algorithmically unknown, right? That if, if we could, if that could be more of a kind of ethos, right? Um, uh, general ethos, I think um, that might be a start, right? Um, uh, in part because, uh, the ways that uh, certain, not all, but um, certain algorithmic uh, systems, um, the ones that I, I study and I'm interested in, um, they're always accompanied by these, these claims to know everything, right? Um, to know everything all the time, uh, the future, right? Um, the past, um, uh, and as, as, as Chad pointed out um, in his talk, um, and you know, I'm thinking about Donna Haraway and Sandra Harding's uh, work as well. Knowing is always knowing from somewhere, right? You're always in a particular position when you know something. So um, there's a sense by which I really like this notion of, of opacity as a kind of um, humility, right? Um, particularly in relation to algorithms and AI. Um, we have time for two very quick questions, and I'm going to ask you to uh, ask the questions together, and then, and then we'll let the, the, the speakers respond, and then it's coffee time. I'm sorry, did you have it? I'm Anna Orlemans from Hamilton College. Um, I'll try to formulate my question very quickly. Both of you are talking about machines that um, involve human choice um, and human interaction. I mean, the, the computer um, searching of, of footnotes, you're testing it, I mean, by the results it's outputting, you're saying, well, that, that's not a footnote, we gotta go back and fix that. Um, and the drones um, involve somebody actually pulling a trigger. Um, and, you know, drones are a part of a, a history of machines of killing um, that have evolved from, you know, sticks, clubs, arrows, guns, bombs, um, which y one could see a, you know, a, dehumanizing in all of those as well, in terms of the distance that, that those weapons create between the killer and the killed. Um, so it seems to me that, you know, there, there are large continuities here. The books are also machines that, in, that, and language is a machine <laughs> that we've created that humanity is still fully enmeshed with. We choose to use these things. Um, it seems to me there is a possibility in both of what you've talked about of a clear break. Um, rather than a continuity, and for a drone, it would be a drone that kills without, you know, that, is that, that, that has some machine learning in it that, so that the machine itself makes a, the, the chooses who to kill and when to kill without a human um, operator. And I suppose the same might be true for um, the kind of neural network. You know, when, when machines make choices about, that, that have actual human implications. And I, I did, so I'm wondering if, if you see that as a, as a, as a kind of clear breaking point morally, epistemologically. Can, can we have the other question and then, and then responses? Uh, for Jennifer, I'm, I'm suddenly struggling with the word dehumanization mm. and wondering if the connotations are going to be changing because at this moment when we're humanizing things and wondering if right. machines have rights right. and um, I think we're at a at a transition moment in our relationship with animals also, mm -hmm. who are we're eating less of them and um, and we think of machines and animals as our friends because without humans they're not motivated to hurt us, and if in fact some of what we're noticing is not a dehumanization but a hyperhumanization of the um, of that which we kill 
before we will be killed. And, and that what's going on in the separating of parents from children, mm -hmm. again, is n we're not being discouraged from seeing them as people, actually. I mean, and uh, I'm thinking even the, that cartooning works both ways. That cartooning is making bugs fl friendly and mice friendly. Um, but sometimes it's an exaggeration of the features of the, the special features of the human, like the Nazi propaganda of big nose or slanted eyes or whatever it is that makes these humans the humans we need to um, eliminate. Uh, that so I'm I'm wondering if those positive connotations of humanizing are being threatened. Um, so, from both of you, please. No, go ahead, Jennifer. Go ahead. Please. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think in part this is uh, also a kind of um, disciplinary or subdisciplinary question, right? Uh, about various kind of um, uh, disciplinary con traditions within posthumanism. You know, animal studies. Um, and and uh, for me, I I still come back to to um, an insistence on on the human in a in a particular way. And here I'm drawing on the work of, for example, um, Zakia Iman Jackson, who talks about well, we can't claim to move beyond the human when some humans have never been granted human status, right? So that's what I'm holding on to um, here, and. I think the work that's being done in these other other discourses is incredibly important. Um, for me, I'm contending first with that version of the human and how I'm not ready to kind of move to that next step yet um, in terms of the way the things that I I'm interrogating and examining. And how about that first question? Is there is there in fact a break that we are approaching or have already passed? Um. I would just uh, point to one um, apocalyptic uh, scenario that was published uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> uh, so some Cambridge researchers have melded exactly what we're talking about, um, neural networks and facial recognition technology and drone technology um, that would precisely, they didn't put missiles on the drone yet, um, but what they've, that what they've done is they've created drones. Um, you know, it's very easy to imagine. You know, they just had to put, you know, kind of a machine on board. Um, that uses uh, readily available facial recognition technology um, to recognize potential criminal actions, right? And how do they do that? They do that um, by using facial recognition technology. So that that future is in some ways already here or it's already um, in a computer science journal. And I mean, and the, just the scale of this, you know, China passed just several months ago, um, a rule by which all Chinese high, high school students have to take a machine learning course, right? And they and yeah. the Chinese government um, published the machine learning textbook. And so the scales at which this is operating, it's not just the scales in terms of um, kind of data scales, uh, the dimensionality and s the simply the surfeit of data, um, but it's also the institutional scale um, that, that I find uh, what is that is ramifying at such a pace as to, to kind of, to be confounding. Um, and then just very quickly about the, the human category, and this I think, was your, you said Andreas, is that? Mm -hmm. Andreas, Andreas is yeah. uh, I imagine it seems like we may disagree about this. Um, but I think to me that's, that's one of the crucial questions, right? I mean, um, you know, the, ha the, the ways in which um, an implicit or an array of implicit philosophical anthropologies have undergirded the modern uh, institutionalized humanities project goes back to at least um, in terms of the institutional history that I'm familiar with, the late 19th century. And however, uh, and we, we keep running up against it again and again. It's the return of the same. And you know, you know, I would say because it's a context I know best. You know, Diltai and the German project to institutionalize a modern humanities was an explicit attempt to reject. Um, what Diltai and some of his colleagues saw as an underlying uh, materialism that was not compatible uh, with the forms of agency imagined uh, by some of the most idealist uh, German leaders. And do we, like, all right, do we want to commit ourselves to the forms of uh, human autonomy that subtended a lot of that institutionalization? You know, and that's, you know, some of the best work. You know, Chakrabarty's been writing about this for the past um, five or six years. 
so that's how I heard your question, and I, I still don't think we've kind of faced up to our philosophical anthropologies that um, organize the ways in which we know and how we teach. Excellent. Um, great questions, great responses, and great papers. Let's thank our speakers one more time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>